Wait, don't start talking yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, you're free to start. All right, I believe we're live. Hello, everyone. I am Lane Brown. Um, previously on the Proco channel live stream, I did a demonstration using my charcoal brushes for procreate and this time i've been asked to demonstrate uh, my use of my pastel brushes which is another pack that i recently made let me just bring up to start off with a portrait that i just finished uh, yesterday actually um, using my pastel brushes i'll zoom in i'm really excited to share this because i have so much fun um, using Procreate now and getting very traditional effects. There's really fun textures and colors. Uh, let me just zoom in. I had so much fun uh, drawing this eye. And these lips. Uh, this one I spent about four hours on. I'm not gonna have that much time. Uh, now I'll have about two hours, so hopefully I can get a good start on the portrait. Um, kind of just you know share my ideas as I go. Um, but yeah, I don't expect to get this much level of this level of detail and finish, but um, I'll we'll see what we do. We'll see how far we can get. Um, so let me talk a bit about my setup. I have a camera over my head. I'll try to keep my head out from in front of the, uh, the camera, but it might bob in from time to time. I'm working on a custom-made board that I made to um, hold my iPad. Uh, right in front of me. Um, I do a lot of drawing on 18 by 24 sheets of paper, specifically when I'm drawing traditionally in charcoal. And I really like that setup. And I wanted to emulate that um, here um, with, with the iPad and Procreate. So I made a board about the same size, 18 by 24. Um, last time I had a prototype. It was made of just two sheets of foam core glued together with a slot cut out um, the size of the iPad. Um, this one, I've uh, improved it. I made it out of wood, nice smooth surface here. The beauty of this is that my iPad can sit down in the slot and it's flush with the board. So my hand can rub across uh, the surface without being interrupted at all. Um, it's just a lot more comfortable. I can work towards the edge of a drawing without my hand having to hover in the air sort of awkwardly. So I have more stability and control. Um, one upgrade that I made to this version, if I move the board, you can see here, I made a slot here where I can plug in uh, the charging cable. So I never have to you know, take my tablet out to charge it. I can just keep drawing as long as I like. So yeah, it's good, uh, fairly cheap, easy to make. Uh, I'm leaning this up against my desk and my, my screens are right in front of me, so I have reference right there. All right, so we have a lot of ground to cover, and I just want to jump into it. Um, let me pull up a reference image that I chose. I'm going to do a portrait. Uh, this reference image comes from the Graphic Studio Collection. Um, they make tons of great um, figure drawing and model reference now. I believe there's a pack on Proku.com also. Definitely recommend them if you're looking for a good reference. Um, so I'm just going to start by importing a paper texture. Um, and this is one that I made. There's an assortment that comes with the, the pastel pack of brushes. Um, so this is a green texture. I think I'm going to modify it to start. 
going to lower the saturation and brighten it up just a little bit, just so it's not quite so green. A little bit more of a neutral tone. Oh, and also another fun gadget that I just recently got, like I've got this in the past week. This is a little a wireless keyboard that uh, has hotkeys for Procreate. So it has like the brush, the eraser, brush size, um, quick menu. Um, the best thing about it, in my opinion, is the, the color sampler tool, which is what I use the most. Um, it makes it so much easier um, to to grab a color quickly because otherwise I have to like press this little on screen button, this little square between the sliders, which I found is super finicky. Half the time it just doesn't work. Um, but now that I have this physical button, it always works when I want it to and it feels great. Um, so I highly recommend this. This one has like a sort of an odd brand. I can't even pronounce the name. Um, but if you go on Amazon and just search Procreate keypad or keyboard, it should pop up. Highly recommend it. Um, I'm also working with a, a screen protector. Let me grab this right here. Um, just this brand, paper light screen protector. This adds a bit of tooth, so my pen doesn't slip around so much. When I uh, when I first tried the iPad on the the bare glass, it was just far too slippery. I had no control. It felt terrible to me. Um, put the screen protector on, it feels great. But I have heard uh, mixed reviews, like some people actually prefer the, the smoother surface. So, you know, it's up to you. Anyways, I'm just going to start on this portrait and see how far I can get. I'll talk a little bit about the brush pack itself. You know, I want to promote it a little bit because I, I think it's a great tool. Um, but I'm not going to go through all the brushes. Um, this is, it's similar to my, my charcoal pack, if, if you watched the last video. Um, but the difference being that this one's more geared towards working with color and texture. And so I really want to, to demonstrate that today. So I'm just going to start by grabbing a pencil. Grab sort of a neutral brown color. And I'm just going to start roughly sketching in my subject. So I haven't drawn yet today, so I'm kind of just taking this, this time to warm up. Very loose, nothing too precise. Um, I, I really love this subject. Um, this model has wonderful big hair framing her face. So these are going to be really fun shapes to draw, I think. And by the way, I am in South Carolina. It's a great day today. I'm an illustrator and concept artist. I work out of my home and really enjoy working remotely. And on my spare time, I just do lots of you know, personal work, personal paintings, drawings, I do lots of figure drawings. I have a, a local figure drawing group that I go to once a week. And uh, usually I choose to draw traditionally with charcoal because my professional work has me at my desk all day, every day, looking at screens, doing digital work. And so I like to just you know take that, that one day a week just to, to work traditionally. But there are times when I take my iPad to the figure drawing group. 
it comes in really handy, especially when like the room is like really crowded and there's not much room for, you know, a large board. Maybe there's not enough chairs for me to uh, grab two of them and lean my board against one of them. You know, maybe it's just tight. And so the iPad then doesn't take up much space at all. It's just like the size of a small sketchbook. But for the most part, I use the iPad like I'm doing it right now. I you know, just use it here at home, I'll lean it up against my desk in front of my reference. So I'm just very loosely blocking in the features I see. I'm trying to find their relative positions I just love layout. Like already, this has such a traditional look and feel to me. I'm I'm drawing just as I would with a charcoal pencil right now, um, and that's really the 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 beauty I think of the Apple Pencil is it feels so natural. If I draw on the tip, I can get a sharp line. If I draw on the broad side. And get a broad edge, broad soft edge. So this allows me to quickly transition between them just as I would an actual pencil. Don't have to fiddle with any of the controls to change the brush size. So I'm squinting at my reference to try to see the big shapes and not get too distracted by the smaller details. It's very easy and very tempting to get caught up in those, those features, but I don't wanna do that yet. I just wanna plot them out, their position As humans, we are highly sensitive to reading faces. We look at faces every day, all the time, to read subtle expressions. So it's really important, I think, when you're drawing a portrait, to, to take the time to make sure you get everything in the right place. And it's best to do that at this stage before you add a lot of rendering. You just have loose marks that you can easily move around. I want to block in the hair fairly simply. 
when I squint at it, it's basically just becomes, you know, a big dark shape. And that's how I want to start. Even though I can see when I, when I look closely, there's a lot of complexity with all the curls and strands of hair in there. But I want to begin by simply uh, stating it as a very simple shape. So basically just shading it in with big strokes, big sweeping strokes. I do want there to be a sense of energy and gesture in my strokes though. So I'm, I'm looking at the shapes that I see and in some places I'm trying to push them a bit, push them a bit uh, further so they have a bit more character. Again, I'm just taking my time at this stage, trying to get these features in the right place relative to each other. The time I spend here at this stage will uh, pay off dramatically as I begin to render, because if I start you know, getting into the tight details with this and then discover that I need to change something, it's gonna you know, require a lot more work to modify something that has a lot of uh, rendering on top of it. I'm also, you know, I'm drawing with a sense of haste um, for one, because I do have a, a short time limit, but I also like to pretend that I'm drawing from life. I like to pretend that my model is in front of me and she can only hold the pose for so long. I feel that, you know, that sense of haste uh, helps to give my drawing a greater sense of spontaneity, more energy. Um, and also I, I focus on the details that really matter and I don't get as distracted by things that don't. I really enjoy drawing from life and I, I really prefer it when possible because the, the energy and the atmosphere in the room uh, do you know, affect the drawing. I try to capture that sense of atmosphere. Um, and oftentimes, like when you're, you know, actually working from life in front of a live model, 
uh, you know, they're not perfectly still. They all move a little bit, sway a little bit. And while that can be a bit annoying, it can also be, you know, helpful because it can allow you to see um, subtle differences, subtle differences in the pose that maybe you like more than the static photograph would be. It gives you a bit more options to choose from. Yeah, I think this is looking pretty close, but I want to keep analyzing it for a couple more minutes before I begin to add color. And right now, I'm basically using the same approach as I would uh, with charcoal. Maybe it's a little bit looser because I do know that I'm going to be working over top of it. And uh, whereas with charcoal, usually, you know, I try to um, nail down the precise details um, and let them just stay as they are. But in this case, using the, the pastel set, I'm really going to be taking more of a, a painter, uh, the painterly approach, where I'm just kind of establishing a rough sketch that I'm going to go over top of. I might flip. Well, flip the canvas so I can see a reverse image. And if anything's wrong, it should jump out at me. So one thing I'm doing in order to, to find the right placement and alignment for the features is in my mind, I am drawing vertical lines from one feature to the next. Like a line down the corner of the eye, the corner of the nose, into the mouth and seeing how they align. Gonna rotate it just a little bit. All right, I'm gonna make a new layer. I'm gonna set it to overlay. And I'm just gonna start splashing in some some tones and some simple color. There's not a whole lot of cover, uh, color in this reference. Uh, mostly just uh, you know neutral brown tones. 
some warm browns. Um, by the way, in Procreate, you can pull out the color wheel so it sits on the screen. I always find that preferable. So the benefit of using an overlay layer is that as I you know, um, wash these colors in, I'm not um, destroying any of my, my drawing. So one thing I want to do early on here as I begin adding the tones is I want to squint at my subject and try to identify the areas of highest contrast, both in terms of value contrast, light and dark, and areas of edge contrast. And wherever I see the most contrast, I want to go ahead and um, lay those, those points in. So I'm seeing right away, up here on her forehead, right on top of her brow, where her lock of hair overlaps her face, there's a really high contrast edge. And I want to go ahead and establish that. Okay, let's see, what next? Um, the tip of her nose is pretty bright against uh, the dark hair. This side of her face here on the left, um, this you know this contour, this profile edge, is definitely sharper than the right side here, where the the, the hair is softer. That edge is just lower contrast over there. So I want to definitely um, acknowledge that and make sure that this side has a sharper edge than the other. I'll try to zoom in every once in a while so you guys can see the detail. Um, but otherwise, I don't like to zoom in too much too soon. I want to force myself um, to stay fairly zoomed out so that I don't get distracted by the small details. I want to see everything in context to the whole image.
All right, so I think I'll make a new layer now and a new normal layer now to start uh, painting over directly everything that I have. Actually, I might um, copy the canvas and then paste it. Then reposition and scale up the portrait just a little bit so it fills the frame better. Also, I'm going to grab my smudge tool. And I use the smudge tool a lot, primarily as a way to to soften edges, to not back anything that might be too high contrast, too busy looking, or just messy. You know, if I have an area where that just I don't like my brushwork, it's just too messy. I'll just grab my smudge tool and lightly knock it down so that I can come back over it with more precise and controlled marks. So I'm just squinting at my reference and squinting at my drawing, comparing them. Mainly I'm trying to identify where there might be areas that have too much contrast. I want to make sure I have this mouth in the right place. This wireless keypad, keypad is just so useful in situations like this where I'm just constantly sampling new colors so I can move things around. It's so much better than trying to click the on-screen button. All right, so I'm pretty sure that this eye right here is going to be the focal point of the image. On um, the other eye is, you know, it's a bit hidden by the nose. So that's, uh, you know, not going to compete too much. Um, and usually we're drawn to eyes anyways. It's also 
right next to this point of highest contrast. So that will definitely lead the viewer to this area. So as I begin to zoom in a bit more, focus a bit more detail, I'm going to start with this eye. Because I know I have a time limit. There's always a time limit. And I find that it works well to start at your focal point and work outward. Because then, no matter when time runs out, at least your focal point will be addressed and hopefully complete, at least as complete as I can get it. Um, and then once I've you know gotten this eye to look good, I'll have more confidence to branch outward. And usually with that confidence, I'll also be faster. I'll be placing my marks down faster. Um, I will have established most of the color and lighting, and I can sample from that. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Just focus a bit on this eye. Since I spent the time early on to try to make sure everything's in the right position, all the big shapes, now I don't have to worry so much about that. Her eye is mostly in shadow, but if I zoom in on the reference, I can see a hint of color in there in the pupil. But even as I work on this delicate detail, I also want to squint at the reference and try to see the big shapes. I want to see the big shapes of value that define this eye. And that's what I want to establish first. The details don't matter until I uh, you know, capture that, that big shape. And you know, I'm saying this stuff partly to you know just vocalize my process, but also to remind myself. Um, I constantly have to remind myself of the good habits and good techniques while I'm working. Because if I'm not careful, I will just zoom in and start noodling on little details that don't really contribute to the whole image.
I really enjoy this, this vertical highlight that I see on the eyelid. It's usually very exciting to draw the little sparkle, little reflection in the eye. Um, but this one, the, li the light's not catching it. Um, so instead of that, I'm trying to really take advantage of these, these highlights and the lids around the eye. So I'm just very gradually introducing a bit more color, a bit more uh, warmth into the flesh tones here. But I'm letting that green paper texture beneath um, shine through the gaps. That's one thing I was very conscious of when I was designing these brushes um, was to allow for optical blending. And optical blending is when the colors, you know, they shine through the texture, they shine through the layers. You're not necessarily blending everything like you would in oil paint, um, you know, where you actually, you know, take two colors and you mix them together. Instead, it's more about overlapping strokes. And because the strokes are porous, there's a lot of um, um, very bold and deep texture. Um, the, the layers underneath shine through, and so you have optical blending. And I, I really like to work with a, a toned paper, especially like a green tone, when I know I'm going to be painting warm flesh tones, because that green is going to help to neutralize and subdue these these flesh tones, so they don't get, um, you know, too unnaturally vibrant, which I think is a tendency that a lot of artists, including myself, tend to have when we're painting, is to make colors too vibrant. especially with digital, uh, digital painting, you know, we're not limited by the, the physics of the pigments. Um, so it's, it's very easy to, you know, grab the color wheel here and just you know, push it to the extreme in terms of saturation. Um, it, it takes a, takes a lot of restraint to avoid that. So for my professional work, I prim primarily uh, work in Photoshop on my desktop. 
um, you know, especially for paintings that I know were going to take me, you know, many hours, perhaps many days of work. You know, I just feel more comfortable at my desktop computer with a big screen in front of me. Um, and more importantly, having more um, hotkeys so that I can quickly manipulate my image. But I've been really loving Procreate as a digital sketchbook. That's basically how I treat it. I don't tend to do much creative work here in Procreate. It's more direct from observation or direct from reference. It's kind of like my fine art tool compared to Photoshop, which is more my you know, creative professional tool. And I don't know, I guess that's just my own, you know, personal preferences because I know, you know, other artists have, you know, they do everything at Procreate sometimes. Procreate has, I think all the key features uh, for digital painting. Much of it is kind of hidden in the menus and uh, there's a lot of uh, gesture commands that I'm not even very familiar with. Um, so it's a very capable app. And honestly, if I, I think if I were starting, you know, as a beginner artist today, it would be best for me to just uh, focus on Procreate probably. Even though the iPad Pro is not necessarily cheap, when you compare it to the cost of buying a nice computer, nice monitors, nice Wacom tablet, Photoshop subscription, it's actually you know a really good deal. And I definitely recommend it for people who maybe don't have a lot of studio space. Maybe you, your computer isn't that great. Maybe it's a bit old. You know, you know, one one of the most annoying things as a digital artist is dealing with um, slow computers or you know, crashing, you know, any kind of technical issues. And I think one of the the great things to hear about uh, Procreate on the iPad is I I don't have any of that. You know, Procreate is optimized for one platform only, so it's very stable, very reliable. So as you can see, I'm kind of branching out now. I, I feel pretty good about this eye. I could definitely render it a bit further, but for now it feels pretty good. So I'm branching out from that and beginning to address the details around it. And like I was saying, now that I have the, the full range of value and some colors established here, I can work much faster because I can color pick from this area.
I wouldn't consider myself a particularly fast painter. But I don't think you have to draw or paint rapidly in order to get quick results. Quick results are more a matter of making each mark count. The more thought you can put behind each mark, the less you have to modify it. The more uh, rapidly the, the painting is going to come together. I'm brushing in a bit more warmth on the underside of this nose. You know, that's really how I, I think about color. I think about it in terms of warm versus cool. If you want your, your portrait to look lively, it's usually a good idea to have some nice warm flesh tones. But you don't want everything to be warm. Uh, the light in this reference is a relatively cool light, a white light. Um, so most of the reflections on the face are cool. So the shadows are a bit warmer by contrast. So I'm really... Uh, Acknowledging that, maybe going to exaggerate it a little bit, that contrast. Now I'm laying in the nostril here, but before I did that, I wanted to establish that, let me just do it again so you can see, I wanted to establish that big underplane of the nose, just like this, very simple. I want to get that to be accurate first. Because if I place that nostril in and then I decide I have to modify this value, it's gonna be a lot trickier to work around the nostril. So one general rule that I try to follow is um, the strategy of working from big to small and general to specific. So I'm gonna establish that big general form first, the nose. And if I wanted to, I could just, you know, I could spend more time here um, making sure that is as precise as possible. Zooming out to see how it relates to the whole image. I see over here, there's a, there's a high contrast value. So let me place that in.
and again the the light reflections are relatively cool compared to their shadows so i want to emphasize that okay so now i'll just make a new layer just so it's more adjustable if need be and I'm going to place that nostril in again. Now I should say, you know, one of the great advantages of working digitally is that you can take advantage of things like layers. Uh, you don't necessarily have to follow the traditional process of things. But I, when I am aiming for a very traditional looking image, traditional aesthetic, um, I usually want to take a fairly traditional approach. The product is, I mean, the, yeah, the style is a product of the process. If you ever want to emulate an artist's style, um, you should try to figure out their specific process. Because otherwise, it's, it's just not going to work. You might have a surface level of um, mimicry going on, but you won't actually be able to capture their, their style until you know their process. The lips are a really fascinating subject because uh, there's such subtle edge variations going on. And that's really what you have to focus on. After you establish the general shape, value, and color, you really have to address the edges. So, so far I've just used one brush. Um, and this is usually how I, I start an image. Uh, all my pencil brushes are at the top of the list. And then beneath that are, um, you know, more standard pastel type of brushes, broader strokes, chunkier strokes, more texture. Um, so I'll probably add those at a later stage. 
um, when I really uh, begin to address the texture of the image. But right now, this pencil is doing just fine. You know, with the ability to tilt and apply different levels of pressure, I'm able to get a pretty broad range of effects with just this one brush. I find I can get much more variety out of one brush in Procreate than I can, you know, other apps like Photoshop. And I, I am currently developing a, uh, a brush set for Photoshop, actually. Um, it's a little bit more limited, like I'm saying, but uh, um, I'm pretty happy with where it's going. So for those of you who don't have Procreate or don't have any interest in getting an iPad, I am making some, uh, some brushes like this for, for Photoshop. All right, Lane, are you ready for some questions? Hey, yes, I am ready. Perfect. All right, we'll start off with Nikita Y, who asks, who is the model and where can I find this model pack? <laughs> um, so I don't know the name of the model, but this is from one of Graphit Studios uh, reference packs. Um, I'm not sure where their website is, but if you go to Google Graphic Studio Reference, I'm sure you'll find them. And I know there's a pack um, of academic poses, I believe, on Proko.com that Graphic Studio made. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they made really awesome stuff. And they really churn out the packs, too. They've done, you know, uh, quite a lot of them now. So you have a lot to choose from. Cool. Next is uh, Jim A, who says, hi, Lane. What's the best way to get a print from this? Is there a way to set up ah. the document so that later it can be turned into something physical? Thanks. Yeah, you mean just like, uh, you know, exporting your file to print? Um, well, yeah, you can uh, export it in any format you like, I believe. Um, so it should be, you know, same process as any other app, like Photoshop. I don't really uh, print much of my work, actually. And, you know, maybe someday when I have more wall space, I will. But uh, um, most of my stuff is digital, and it's viewed digitally as well. So I don't really think too much about the printing stage. Cool. Magda PG says, thank you for doing a live demo. I can't wait to watch it. I so they must be asking their question in advance. Yeah. I think my only question at the moment is, one of the great advantages of Procreate is the non-digital feeling, but how do we get the best of different layers with these pastel brushes? Selection tools? Do we get to play with those to squeeze results out of the practice, or should we approach in a traditional way? OK, yeah. Um... So I view Procreate as its own unique and powerful medium. And I think you should totally take advantage of all the digital features, all the adjustment tools, all the layers, um, because that's, you know, that's the advantage that this has over traditional, um, where it might have some shortcomings, like you know, it, it, it maybe you can't get quite as precise with your detail, maybe not quite as much friction on the surface. You can make up for that using the digital, the power of the digital tools, the ability to manipulate it, the ability to, um, 
basically work in any order that you like. You don't have to stick strictly to the traditional process. Um, you know, you can place a drawing down, then make a new layer underneath that, and you can paint underneath your drawing, which is, you know, kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, so, yeah, totally take advantage of all the, the digital features. One thing I like to use a lot is the liquify tool, especially. I might use that later for this, just to kind of nudge features into the right place if I misplaced anything. Um, so, yeah, totally take advantage of all of that. All right. Quizzy asks, hello, I hope your day is going well. I've noticed that the artists may make a kind of noise or messy brush strokes where the subject's rendering gets looser and looser until it's just a kind of nonsense. I really like this expressive technique. How do I do it? I've noted it's used in backgrounds and rough paintings too. Thanks. Hmm, interesting. Um, I assume by noise, you're kind of just talking about the, the roughness, the looseness of the strokes towards the, the per perimeters of a drawing. Like in this one, for example, you can see I'm getting you know, very rough and loose of my strokes here. Um, you know, and part of that is because I just haven't gotten, you know, haven't addressed those edges yet. But another reason is because I know since that's on the peripheral of my drawing, I don't want there to be a whole lot of contrast there. Um, I don't want to be there, you know, any super tight edges or high contrast values that will draw the eye and maybe distract from the focal point. So, you know, I'm really wanting to keep uh, you know, my precision, my contrast right here in the focal point um, and not somewhere like over here where it's, it's not that important. And I guess, you know, other than that, uh, let me look at this this previous portrait that I did uh, the other day because um, I added lots of uh, fun texture like to the edges of this one. And, you know, it's sort of almost like particle effects, a little bit of spatter, you know, sort of emulating um, like charcoal dust or pastel dust um, towards the edges. You know, that's really just fun effects. Um, I think it has a really f a nice aesthetic. You know, and I am kind of trying to mimic the look of traditional media, but that's not my highest priority. Um, I'm not trying to fool the viewer into thinking this is traditional. I'm, I'm really just celebrating that appealing traditional aesthetic. I'm trying to capture that. And that's really the whole aim of the, this brush bat. Um, so yeah, I assume that you know, answers your question. Like just, you know, fun, Textures like this, I did this using some of the broader uh, brushes I was talking about. Yeah, hopefully it shows up on screen. It's all pretty subtle. Yeah, I think it's coming through. Cool. And then, yeah, just, you know, this is the focal point of this portrait. So that's where I really want the, the contrast and sharp edge control to be. Okay, so let me jump back to the other one. All right. Kavish Agral asks, Hi, Lane. Can you talk about handling the Apple Pencil like a traditional tool, generally, but especially for your charcoal brush set? Do you think it would be a good idea to have two pencil options in Procreate and a quick gesture shortcut to switch between a hard edge and a soft edge pencil? Hmm. Yeah, interesting question. You know, I'm I'm always for more controls. I think, you know, if you if you like the idea of being able to switch between a sharp edge and soft edge very quickly, that would be, you know, a great feature to have. But I will say like that's kind of the way I design my, my pencil brushes here at the top of the list. Uh, the aim of them was so that if you're drawing on the point. You can get a nice sharp edge. If you're drawing on the side, you can get a soft, broad edge, just like uh, working with a natural, uh, traditional uh, charcoal or pastel pencil. So, to me, I, you know, I don't really feel like I need any more than that. Just the, the the ability to quickly tilt my pencil to get a different effect is 
you know, probably, you know, uh, more desirable than having to uh, switch to a different tool. So, yeah, and, you know, the, the, and that's, you know, uh, that's really one of the goals of uh, the way I design these brushes is so that each one can get a, a variety of effects, be it a, a sharp edge or soft edge or a subtle texture versus, you know, really bold texture simply by the way you manipulate the pencil. And therefore, you don't have to switch brushes nearly as much. So I'm really happy with uh, um, how that turned out with these. Yeah, that seems really cool. Um, Matt Fontaine 22 says, can you show us how the iPad sits in the board you made? Is it just a hole in the board and it's sitting on the desk or is there a lip on the wood? Okay, so this is uh, it's actually two layers. The The top surface is wood with, a, with an iPad size window cut out of it. And uh, glued to the back of it is a sheet of foam core board. So let me just take the iPad out. Um, so you can see, this is a, just a foam core, black foam core. Um, I had to cut a little notch up here for the, the camera to sit in because it, it protrudes a little bit from the back. Um, other than that, there's a little window I made here for the power cord to go through. Um, that also lets me get my finger up under it to take the iPad out, so that's really helpful. Uh, and by the way, I found this really great um, power cord adapter that's magnetic. Um, so it just snaps in there. Um, it's not as, it doesn't stick out nearly as much as like a normal charger cable does. So it fits in this groove really nicely. Um, so let me, but yeah, it was super easy to, to build really. Um, like I, you know, if you look, watch my last stream, I just had the, what I call the prototype. It's just two, um, uh, foam core, foam core sheets glued together. Um, it was super cheap, super easy to make, um, and it worked just as well as this. Um, so I would do that. I would recommend that. It's uh, it's really great if you have uh, like a desk in front of you that you can lean the board against. Um, it just gives me a lot more control because I don't have to have one hand, you know, holding the iPad itself. Both hands can participate, especially since I have. Uh, this keypad here, you know, one of them can be working on that while the other one draws. So feels really great. Really enjoying it. All right. Aliyah Rob says, hi, Lane. Don't know if you answered this in the beginning of the live stream, but can you let us know what device you are using with your left hand? I'm assuming it adjusts settings as you draw. Thanks. Yeah, so this is just, uh, I went on Amazon and uh, found what they call a Procreate keyboard. Um, so this is the brand. Um, it's like Oik Thai. I don't know. I can't pronounce that. Uh, but <laughs> the layout, I wish I could kind of modify the layout a little bit because uh, it is kind of an odd layout. But primarily, I'm just using the, the eyedropper and um, the quick menu button most of the time. I kind of just bounce between those. The other things uh, like undo, I can do with my my fingers, gesture control very easily. Um, but it does have all the features you might want, like be able to adjust the brush size. You can do undo and redo. You just got, uh, you can adjust the layers. You can adjust hue, saturation, brightness, you know, a bunch of nice commands. So it's a really great tool. And it's definitely speeding up my workflow, I can say that for sure. Nice. Michael Mendiola says, thank you, Stan and Lane, for the great stream. Lane, in your daily art practice, do you cover both observation and imagination, or do you section the week off and primarily focus on one or the other depending on the day? Or do you use your off time for observation and work your imagination for jobs. How would you describe your balance? Yeah, so I've, I've never had any strict schedule, uh, you know, for my uh, 
uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, work. Um, I try to keep, you know, a fair balance though. I, I, like I said, most of my professional work is done on Photoshop. I do illustration and concept design. So that tends to be very, you know, creative oriented. Um, but then, you know, I also enjoy just taking a more fine art approach to things and drawing from reference and observation. Um, and I think it's important to have a balance because if you want your imaginative work to to feel believable, then you need to study the world in reality. Um, study, specifically study light and color from life if, if whenever possible. Um, so yeah, I, I try to keep a balance, but I don't have any strict schedule. Um, I think that answers that. All right. Melendek asks, what techniques do you use with such textured brushes when going into details like gold, jewelry, and eyes? I always wonder what is necessary and what isn't when working with brushes that don't have solid edges. Hmm. Interesting. So you're talking mostly about uh, shiny surfaces, it sounds like. And so that's, to me, that's really the, the, those are really fun to paint. Like if you look at these, the eye, the nose here, for example, um, the eye is mostly soft, mostly soft edges, but there are like a few points here, a few edges that I try to make really sharp. And, you know, specifically like the specular highlight on the eye, I want that to feel, you know, really high contrast, really sharp. Um, so that feels like it's sitting on top almost. Um, so, you know, I feel like most of it can be drawn with a relatively soft brush and that's how I do it. You know, very gradual buildup, um, soft edges. And they come in, you know, press a little harder. Like I was saying again, you know, it's the great thing about these Apple Pencil and these brushes that you can simply by manipulating the way you, you know, hold the pencil and the pressure you apply, get sharp edges. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, to me, it's like, it's more like just, um, you know, you need to study those subjects, you need to study metal, study how those reflections work. You know, one thing about shiny materials is, is that you'll tend to have a, a very high contrast between the, the dark reflections and the bright reflections right next to each other. So in the eye, for example, you have that, that, that dark pupil. Um, right next to that bright specular highlight. So super high contrast um, that really uh, draws your eye to it. And like the nose too, like most of the nose, as you can see, especially in the half tone, is very softly uh, applied, very soft transitions. Um, but then I'm very conscious, I want that, that specular highlight to be sharp, or at least mostly sharp. Um, you know, I like to be very specific here. Um, I was very conscious to like make this bottom edge of that highlight sharper than these other edges, because I want there to be variety, even within this little shape, I want there to be contrast between soft and hard edge. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Cool. Cool. Creative Name says, I'm having trouble learning how to draw details with a digital sketch pad without a screen. What are you drawing with now? Oh, yeah, we've already talked that this is an iPad. Um, is this is that a better option for a beginner? So I assume you're mostly working on like a, a traditional tablet, like a uh, Wacom Intuos tablet, um, no screen. You know, that's actually what I use primarily um, for my work in Photoshop, I just use a regular non-screen tablet. Um, it's difficult to say which is better for a beginner, right? Because I started with the Intuos tablet without a screen. Um, I suppose, you know, having a screen is going to be more intuitive because, you know, you don't have to get used to the whole separation between the, you know, hand and eye coordination. 
And yeah, like I was saying before, I think the iPad is a really great option for beginners these days because it's it's a full studio in one compact device. You don't need to go out and buy an expensive computer and make sure you have nice color calibrated monitors and then you know get all the the drivers working for all the different apps and hardware. Uh, that can take up a lot of your time. It can be super frustrating and if you you know if you get too wrapped up into all that technical issues it could completely you know discourage you from working on your art so um like i was saying i think one of the, the great things about this device is that it's so easy and so reliable um and it has all the essential features that you need for digital painting um i do like from i do often uh export my images and then maybe just touch them up add the final you know adjustments in photoshop just because i'm i've used photoshop for like 15 years now and i'm just more comfortable with that but um i really do think procreate has all the essential tools you need so highly recommend it cool cool Mr. Anonymous says, pardon my observational stupidity, but can someone explain to me the pose? Like, I don't get that long <laughs> rod behind her. How is her right arm posed? Yeah, so if I had to corrupt this a little bit, um, uh, but basically she's like, she's hunching over and she's holding a staff over her shoulder. Um, it's kind of an interesting sort of like uh, jungle lady primal huntress pose i guess if i had to describe it but her but she's tilted forward and her so uh her back is be, you know up behind her it is kind of odd when you look at the crop version but i'm mainly just uh focused on her face which i thought was a really great uh framing with that hair yum c says oh my god i never knew i could pin the wheel to the screen Thank you. Yeah, I think that was added in like uh, the Procreate 5 update or something. Um, so yeah, you can just open the color wheel, click this little bar, and you can drag it out, put it anywhere on screens. It's really handy. Uh, makes it a lot faster to pick colors. And there's, there's so many hidden features in Procreate. Um, you really have to like... Uh, go on YouTube and search for someone who's like telling you how everything works to figure it out. And that, there's so much I still don't know. Uh, I just basically just focus on the, the, the essential features. Kinda Aljohani asks, where can I buy more of Procreate brushes? Well, my brushes are on proco.com and I believe there's a sale going right now uh, um, for a Lightbox Expo. Um, so you can find, I have a, a charcoal brush pack, um, which is what I demoed last time, um, which really tries to emulate just the, let me bring up the image. It just tries to emulate that, uh, that traditional look and feel of uh, working with charcoal on um, like newsprint paper, which is what I do a lot when I'm doing figure drawing. Um, so, and the uh, the pastel pack is it's similar, but it's more geared towards working with color and texture. You get a, get a lot more color variety with the pastel brush. I mean, uh, a lot more texture variety with the pastel brushes. Um, and it's like I was saying, it's really geared towards um, optical blending where the layers beneath will uh, pass through the layers above. And so you get the color blending optically that way. That's uh, really fun. Um, but those are just my brush packs. Of course, I recommend them. Personally, I haven't found anything that feels quite as good when you're working in this style and this approach, um, because these were geared specifically for this look and this approach. But I'm sure there's hundreds of great packs out there. so. Definitely um, explore others as well. This is a portrait I did just using the charcoal pack. And 
Uh, each of the packs comes with uh, paper textures, which is what I like to start with. Um, just import those when you're ready to start a new image. Um, and I feel, you know, that provides a nice subtle texture. Um, sometimes it, they come in different tones and different colors. So you can incorporate that into your drawing like I was doing with this uh, portrait today. Um, yeah, it's just fun. It's more fun, I think, than a, a blank white canvas. Let's see, here's another portrait I did a while back using the pastel set and uh, really trying to capture that traditional look and feel. And it's just so much fun. Uh, um, playing with color and texture. Here's another with the pat, I mean, the charcoal pack. And you can, of course, like use color with the charcoal brushes. Um, I think uh, this one, this one I used the charcoal brushes before I developed the pastel pack. And so you can get good color with that. It just doesn't have quite as much uh, texture. All right. October Comstock says, do you have any tips for breaking down light on complex objects, like a glass of water, for example? Hmm, wow. Well, my first advice, and this pretty much goes for any subject, is to look through squinted eyes at your subject. Try to see the big shapes of value first without being distracted by the tiny little highlights and you know, sparkly details because you need to establish those those big tonal shapes first once you've done that then you can open your eyes and see all those details and uh, apply those sparkly highlights on top so you're kind of you know you're kind of separating the information you're making it easier for yourself because when your eyes are fully open at any subject especially a complex subject like a glass of water um, with all those reflections you know you're just kind of blinded by all the information there is so you need to make it simpler for yourself and one of the best ways is to squint um it can take practice you know uh but uh yeah that's how I would approach that. All right. That was our last question. Thank you so much, Lane, for the stream. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I think the portrait, you know, it's it's still unfinished, but it's a good start. Um, pretty happy with the 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 uh, the energy and the strokes in this, but. If I wanted to finish it, it'd probably be a, probably another hour's work to really refine everything. Uh, but I hope this demo was informative. Um, and I want to thank uh, Proco team for the opportunity. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to have you here. <laughs>